Good morning, friends. Let's just bow our heads just for a moment, shall we? As I pray that my words, as always, will be in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, second half of John 6. We've just heard it from Bill. Do you reckon it's hard teaching? I think it is. It, even if you're a fair way along the road, as it were, in the spiritual life, it's hard teaching. And you know, if you were an unbeliever and you were told to read this passage, at the end of it all you would think, what on earth was that all about? I don't get that at all. Wow, what a load of... But of course, that is real, real meat and food in it all. Jesus said what he said. So because of that, there has to be something in it. And we're reading about this crowd, aren't we? This crowd of people and... It's that that they're seeking. It's not that they're seeking Jesus for uh, the wrong reasons. But really, they're, they're just ready to settle for barley loaves and sardines, if you like. And when Jesus came to give them eternal life, through what we've read, the clear lesson is, look beyond the flesh. The crowd were only interested in talking about bread. It was all about bread. That's the subject. So, okay, Jesus stays on the subject of bread uses bread as an analogy, that's all that's on their minds, so he stays with that. And I don't know about you, but I, I love looking at the interactions Jesus has with people in the Gospel of John. And what I really like is uh, when you read that Jesus gives people what they need, not always what they're looking for. Sometimes he heals and offers words of life, sometimes he calls us and rebukes when people come with the wrong motives, but he always knows what the people are after. And he offers them the truth, and he offers them the grace. And we're going to have a look at a story here. It's an interesting story. It takes place the day after Jesus has fed 5,000 with just a few loaves and a fish, and fishes. An incredible miracle. And now that people have seen that miracle, they want more. We didn't read it, of course, because the passage is too long. But if you go back to early John, what happened in the first part of John was just 24 hours before what happened in the second part of John. And these people, rather than go home and return to their jobs, they decide to chase Jesus down. They're walking, they're running over 10 miles, as it were, to find him on the other side of the lake. And um, actually, again, we can read it, although it wasn't just read. Uh, when they finally ask him how he got there so quickly, when it took them all night, Jesus ignores that question. In truth, he had taken the shortcut. He walked on the water, gone direct across the lake. So instead, he, he sidesteps their questions and responds to their hearts. And he, ask, he answers them. He says, well, truly, truly, I say to you, you're seeking me, not because you saw signs, because you ate, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Now, don't work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man, that's him, will give to you. For on him, God the Father has set his seal. Now we need to understand something here. We live in a culture where very few people are actually starving. Almost everyone has access to food. And most of us have access to more food than we could possibly ever eat. But that is not true for much of the world today. And it certainly wasn't true for the people following Jesus. Food was scarce during those times. So when you found a source of food, you followed it. Because food was life, it was the most important thing to them. We might not fully grasp that because we got so much, but to them it was a big deal. And Jesus, well, because, because he's Jesus, knows what they're after. They want another free meal. They wanted to see another magic trick. They followed Jesus not because of who he was, but rather because of what he could do for them. They were after bread to sustain their temporary life, but Jesus was trying to give them eternal life. That's what they're after. Straightforward bread, that's all they could think about. They didn't want Jesus, he was just a means to an end. He was a way that they could get what they were really after. So he says to them, or rather they say to him, I should say, what must we do to be doing the works of God? And Jesus answered them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him, in whom he has sent. So they said to him, well, what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work will you perform? Our fathers ate manna in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Now hang on. 
Jesus has just done that. Not even 24 hours ago, they ate their fill on bread and fish, an incredible miracle, and they reveal their true colours again. They're just trying to trick him into doing it again. They just want a free meal. But again, let's put ourselves there. What's our bread? What is the thing that we pray for and try to, if you like, trick God into, into giving us? God, if you just give me this, if you will just give me that, then I'll never miss church again. Or I'll give 20% of my money away, or maybe not 20, but perhaps 10. Okay, five, whatever. What is bread? What is this bread to us? Jesus points out to them that they're after the wrong thing. What they want is temporary, but what they should be after is eternal. What we're going to see in their response and throughout the rest of this interaction is a huge, massive misunderstanding. They're both talking about bread, but they're on, pa they're on parallel lines. They're not meeting up. They're not meeting up at all. What they want is physical, literal bread. And Jesus' response is clear. His lesson's clear. Look beyond the flesh. But you know, they don't get it. They don't get it. They can't get past the bread that they want. Jesus keeps telling them, I came to give you eternal life, bread that will not spoil. But they keep on saying, yeah, 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 we know all that. That's great. But that bread yesterday you gave us, Jesus, was pretty tasty. Maybe you can give us a bit more of that. Let's be honest, maybe we can probably see ourselves in that a little bit. I know I can, that's me sometimes. God is so much for me, but I can't sometimes get past the bread, literally. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. They said, give us this eternal bread. So Jesus gives them another chance. I am that eternal bread. If you follow me, I will be fully satisfied. Now, don't let's miss this. Jesus isn't saying, follow him, follow me, and I will give you your desires. He's not saying, follow me, and you'll have all the bread that you'll ever want. Rather, he's saying, if you follow me, I will be your bread. I alone will satisfy you. But the crowd didn't get it. And sometimes, neither do we. So the Jews, we read in verse 41... The Jews grumbled about him and said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. In other words, they were grumbling because they didn't get what they wanted. Yesterday, they were willing to inaugurate Jesus as king because he gave them what they wanted. Today, when Jesus asks for their allegiance, he rejects them. They reject him. Let's make this personal. If Jesus doesn't give us this bread that we want, are we going to follow him? Jesus is after us. He wants us. He doesn't want us to follow him just because of what we can get from him. He wants us to follow him, really, because of him, because of who he is. And he goes on to teach that back in their history, he goes on to teach back in their history and continues to show what he means, but they just don't get it. They can't get past the bread. They can't get past thinking about their next meal. And Jesus finally ends with this statement. Truly, truly, I say to you that unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, drink his blood, you've got no life in you. Whoever does feed on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I'll raise him up on the last day. Wow, that is hard teaching. If anybody says, no, 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 that's sort of straightforward enough. I think, oh, really? <laughs> well, I can see you haven't joined the club because the big club is that most of us, believers and unbelievers, think... Hang on, can we unpack this? Well, unbelievers might just dismiss it. It's a load of, oh, no wonder I don't believe in all that stuff anyway, when you hear all this. But Jesus, as Bill's already said this morning, is not advocating cannibalism, as some people would probably think when he's speaking the way he does. He's not talking about communion even. He's simply running with the analogy that he's been using all the time. They want bread, and Jesus desperately wants them to know that the bread they're after will only offer momentary satisfaction. It'll only sustain for a few hours, but he, what he offers, will last for all eternity. He's telling us not to try and get something or, 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 or someone what you can only get from God. The crowd wanted bread. Jesus is offering way more than a free meal. And that's pretty much it, really. Because if we're striving for anything other than Jesus... It will let us down. If we get whatever it is that we're after, it will be unable to deliver what it promised. We know that's true. Think back to the things in the past that you strive for. 
They never quite lived up to the hype sometimes, did they? That's what Jesus is saying. And that's why he's using the analogy of bread. Think of the best meal you've ever had. I don't know, some pot restaurant, whatever. You've eaten since then, haven't you? Why? Because it wasn't enough. You needed more to sustain yourself. That didn't last. You need to eat again. Jesus is using this illustration to point to the other areas of our life. Because there are other areas where we think that if we can just get whatever, then we'll be happy. Then we'll be satisfied. We think that without the bread we would die. We think that we could not possibly live, or at least live happily without the bread. The literal bread. The physical bread. But Jesus tells us something different. He comes in and says, without me, you will die. Without me, you will never be satisfied. Many of us are after things that will only offer momentary satisfaction. Jesus is trying to get, get us to think past our physical needs, our wants and our desires, and focus on what is eternally important. He's trying to get us to rearrange our lives. The story of salvation, friends, when you think about it, is a pretty simple one. Just as well, otherwise I'd have a problem. And yet many people refuse to accept it. Is this because it's free? Would they feel better if it were earned? Jesus in verse 27 of what we read is, says, Do not work for the food that spoils, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. In other words, he's telling them not to seek or work for food that spoils or rots. And in particular, their eternal salvation is in all this. It's easy for us to see this in the Bible with hindsight, but to put this into context or perspective, how about we as a church, we, let's say we go into the middle of Redditch and we miraculously conjure up free food and then invite whoever's passing by to help themselves. I'm sure they'd indulge, particularly if the food is good. Now if we were to say to them whilst they're eating, come to our church next Sunday, Ridgeway Community Church, and hear about the Lord. I'm sure that many would come, but how many of them would be there just for the free food? More food and more drink in here. I don't know about you, I'd be looking for more food also. I don't know whether... It's... That's pretty terrible because you can see where Jesus is coming from. Can you see actually what he's trying to get at? He was saying that all of us at all times struggle in life to find a meaning, to find purpose and value. And that's because God created us to be like that. To seek for a meaning and to seek a relationship with him. But we all miss that relationship in the beginning because of sin. Not our present sins, but the sin of mankind going all the way back to Adam and that. It was St. Augustine, I guess many of you heard of the guy, he's a 5th century fella, who highlighted this. He said that every single person has within them a God-shaped vacuum in their soul that is impossible to fill. But everyone, and I mean everyone, has tried to fill this vacuum one way or another with a whole host of things, but we all know they only work for us for a while. So we can see what Jesus was trying to tell them. Stop thinking about the temporal and start thinking about the eternal. Stop thinking about food that satisfies an empty stomach and start thinking about spiritual food that satisfies an empty soul and will last forever, literally. To move on, have you, have you ever given a gift to someone that they didn't fully appreciate? You know, you've gone to a lot of trouble with this and it's just right for them, put a lot of effort into them and at the end you, you, you sort of give it over and you just see them throw it aside and say, yeah, okay, thanks, I'll, I'll have a look at that later, whatever. That's exactly what's happening here. Jesus is offering eternal life, eternal salvation to the crowds and instead of receiving it joyfully and gratefully they respond with two doubting questions the first one is what must we do what's it going to cost us the first question is asked in verse 28 and then they asked him what must we do to do the work God requires this is a typical legalistic question asked by the Jews and no doubt ourselves what do we have to do on top of what we're doing already to earn this gift of salvation, as nothing in this world is free. Well, we can't blame them in some ways because we're all brought up this way. I mean, we believe that if we do this and we do that, 
then we'll get something, and when we have that something that we've earned, we'll feel satisfied because we've done something for it. That is the normal way of thinking. So if someone says to us, here's a gift for free, our first reactions are, what's the catch? What are you after? And worse, if we don't ask these questions, well, we feel as though we're setting ourselves up to be taken advantage of. So this wasn't in many ways an unreasonable question for the Jews to ask, but here Jesus is saying, I'm giving you eternal salvation for nothing. Only that you believe in me as your Lord, you don't have to, to earn it, you don't have to work for it, you just accept it and let the love of God flow. That's exactly what we've been asked to do, and many people find this impossible to understand. But there are no ifs, there are no buts, there are no, if I will do this and I'll do that, then I'll receive and all the rest of it. We are simply to believe in Jesus and then receive. That is the whole concept of grace, friends. In fact, that is the definition of grace, where we receive something that we do not deserve and we need to get used to it. Sometimes we think that God will love us a little bit more if we just pray a little bit more or study the Bible a little bit more, or be involved a bit more within church, or a charity, or something noble, or even just behave better to those whom we love. That is not what the Bible is saying. The Bible is saying, believe and receive first, and those things will follow. Then, when we truly believe, then we will read the Bible more because we want to learn more, we'll pray more because we want to talk to God, we'll be involved more with church or charity because we want to give our time and our abilities, we'll behave better because we want to be better human beings, we'll simply therefore need to believe first and then receive, or as they say, doubt or go without. So how did Jesus answer the question of what do we do to have to earn this gift? He said the work of God is this, to believe in the one he sent, simply to believe in him. And the second reaction is, let us see some, something miraculous. That's what the crowd ask. The other extreme to illegalism is sensationalism, you know, or astonishment, which means we will want to see something amazing in return for that belief. The crowd are bluntly saying, show us a miracle so as we can believe in you. But Jesus' answer is simple. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry. He who believes in me will never be thirsty. Basically, what he's saying to them is, you want to see a miracle? Here I am. I'm a miracle. And we can understand the crowd again here because they didn't know that Jesus was the Son of God. It wasn't obvious to them that he had renounced his deity. He had laid aside his majesty and became human so that he could die on a cross for our sins, which was yet to happen at that point. The crowd didn't know these things, so how could he have explained to them that at the time? But the crowd had watched him doing a mighty miracle by feeding 5,000 people from nowhere, changing the laws of physics, if you like, by creating matter by something special, so that they must have seen that he had at least that difference. This can't be any ordinary guy, can it, who can do these things? It's got to make you wonder, wow, who could this be? at the very least. Today we too often ask God for some kind of miracle to valid validate our belief, forgetting that he already has. Because Jesus never wanted to be known as Jesus the miracle man, he wanted to be known as Jesus the saviour of mankind. And the greatest miracle that Jesus will ever perform is the miracle that sal of salvation that happens when we accept him. The greatest miracle we will ever see is the miracle of a changed life in him, a life turning away from sin unto righteousness. Yet it doesn't happen overnight. Admittedly, it doesn't happen overnight, but it does happen, as many of us know. And finally, how do the crowds react to this free gift of salvation? Well, to digress slightly in the years that I've been preaching, the one thing that stood out more than anything for me is that Jesus was very human. In lots of ways, he was just the same as you and I. And a case in point is his answer to the crowds in verse 41, which says that the Jews began to grumble about him because he said what he said. It's quite a rejection from the crowd who were bluntly saying, who are you to tell us anything? Oh yeah, son of God are you? What a chick. Oh. It wasn't just the crowds that turned away from him. Verse 60 tells us that the disciples said, it goes beyond the reading we heard, this is hard teaching. Who can accept it? 
Verse 66 is even worse because it talks about many of his disciples turning back and no longer following him. Disciples of his, not just the crowd, that's bad enough. There's a lot of unbelief and a lot of rejection. And they certainly missed the free gift that was on offer that day. Okay, perhaps Jesus didn't fit their image of the Messiah, the conquering king and all the rest of it. But there was a true message there. And I'll give you a sort of example of that. Most churches in most denominations around here, now and again you see it, actually more often than what you might expect, a special service every now and again, where they usually say something like, everyone is made welcome. And to be fair to them, they mean it. And yet there's something in our psyche that says, if it's free and we're welcome, then it's either not worth much or they're after something. And we can miss the point that, is, that it is free to encourage everyone so that they can share what they have. So salvation really is free to those who believe. And yes, we are the product, a product to be used of God himself. God wants us whether we can afford him or not. God wants us despite our faults and our frailties. But most of all, it's free so that, if we, so that we have no excuses for not receiving or accepting that salvation. The salvation that Jesus died in agony on a cross for us to receive and accept this with gratitude, which we rarely do. Our text for this morning has been another way of looking at our salvation. It's intended that we embrace the love that has been poured upon us. That we embrace the gifts of the Spirit that we are now allowed to use. That we are to embrace that relationship with the Lord himself to guide us through our earthly lives. That relationship with the Holy Spirit that even Jesus needed in order to survive on this earth. Let's just bow our heads for a second. Father, this morning we ask that you help us to accept and embrace our salvation. Keep us under, keep us, un, let us understand the whole concept of grace. Accepting your favour despite our faults and weaknesses in that we can ask you whatever we will, and you will answer. Father, we ask in your name only, that of our Lord Jesus. Amen.